Uh, there is a global consensus that extreme weather and uh, disruptions from drought, flooding and conflicts uh, over natural resources disproportionately affect the developing world, particularly the most vulnerable in our communities, including women and children. Air pollution kills more Africans than even childhood malnutrition or contaminated water. Uh, data from uh, WHO shows that annually, there are about 2.2 million environment-related deaths on, on the continent. You know, further, when, when we discuss climate conflict and demography, the issue of adaptation and resilience cannot be overlooked. West African coastal areas, for example, have long provided livelihoods for millions of fishermen. The coastal ecosystems used to provide a range of essential services, including uh, fishery, uh, resources which have now been severely hit, uh, especially on account of rising sea levels, uh, triggering floods, erosion, increased salinity, and disappearance of certain species of fish. Beyond causing major losses in coastal infrastructure, this also exposes many human settlements to the risk of inundation, which results in interregional migration. Of course, this results in loss of lives and livelihoods and often accompanied by community and regional conflicts. Agriculture, as everyone knows, is the backbone of Africa's economy and accounts for the majority of livelihoods across the continent. But our exposure and vulnerability to climate change impacts this also. And so uh, th th these impacts are not limited to certain regions or people but to our economy as a whole, from the macroeconomic impact of rising food prices to health and well-being impacts resulting from, from heat stress. So it's obvious that the global climate, energy, and development conversation can no longer happen on separate tracks. But despite these huge setbacks that, that I've mentioned, and despite being negligible contributors to CO2 emissions, we and in Africa continue to be the most adversely impacted by climate change, so much so that public resources that could help modernize our energy mix has to be redirected towards adaptation spending. But worse, we are being compelled to make disproportionately huge sacrifices as the wealthier countries continue full speed on, uh, on, on defunding gas projects and insisting that gas projects must be defunded as, uh, as an important component of, of, the, of, of the drive towards net zero emissions by 2030. So our first obligation for us and the, for African countries must always be to ensure the well-being of our people through access to development services, including electricity, healthcare, education, safe jobs, and a safe environment, including access to clean cooking fuels. We must prioritize solutions that align the development and climate agendas. And that is absolutely important. We must align the development and climate agendas. The global climate conversation can only be equitable and inclusive by putting all people in all geographies at the heart of the endeavor to save the planet. We must recognize and plan for growing energy demand. Its increase will be critical for driving growth, jobs, and, eco and economy-wide progress, and delivering health uh, healthcare and education services. Efforts are already underway, for example, in my country, Nigeria, and, se and several countries across the continent, to transition to large shares of clean energy sources to do this. To get the world on track for net zero emissions by 2050, the amount of investments required in clean electricity generation and grid storage infrastructure will need to rise to more than 1.6 trillion US dollars as per year by, by 2030 at least. This is over four times more than what was invested in these sectors in 2020. In regions like Africa, installed electricity capacity will need to double from by 2030 and increase at least fivefold by 2050. So much of the global investment in clean electricity will need to go into Africa. However, instead of prioritizing efforts to redirect global capital to our nations, efforts are underway to limit the development of gas projects in Africa 
violating the principles of equity and justice enshrined in global agreements. Further, it also poses a grave threat to Africa's energy transition because the role of gas, for example, as a bridge fuel to increase the share of renewable energy in the energy mix and to rapidly transition away from firewood-based cooking fuel to natural gas-based cooking yields. You know, uh, obviously, uh, to natural gas-based uh, uh, cooking, obviously yields both environmental and health benefits. But LPG-based policies, uh, liquefied um, um, uh, gas-based policies, and schemes are critical to realizing uh, the required annual global investment in gas for cooking to increase rather than be constrained. The global community must recognize that all fossil fuels are not the same, and the critical role of bridge fuels in advancing the energy transition and addressing uh, energy poverty is it, 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 absolutely crucial. Making capital available to fulfill the growing demand, uh, the growing energy demand in these regions of the world is central to reaching the goals of the Paris Agreement. So the energy access element of the energy transition and the adaptation and resilience element of climate change must all be interlinked and given equal importance. If energy access issues are left unaddressed, we'll continue to see growing energy demand being addressed with high polluting and, defore and, and deforesting fuels, such as diesel, kerosene, and firewood. As a result, efforts aimed to advance climate goals must first and foremost create carbon space for growing economies that have historically made tangible contributions to global emissions and have an obligation to their people to provide access to energy for electricity, for cooking and productive uses. I think clearly uh, a just transition would involve taking into account access to energy for, uh, for African countries. Yeah, and, and really creating, as I've said, you know, uh, carbon space for us. There, there is no way that we can have a just transition without taking into account the fact that we require transition fuels, such as gas, for example, to be able to make that transition effectively and cost effectively for, for, uh, for, for, many, for many African countries. What we are seeing at the moment, you know, is, is a rush towards um, uh, to uh, defunding gas projects, which obviously means that we're not going to be able to use this transition fuel, or at least be able to use it at any kind of cost that will make sense, uh, which of course means that access to energy for us, for, for uh, many developing countries and many African countries, will be well nigh impossible in, in, in some cases. So I think that, that uh, a just transition obviously must take into account all of the requirements uh, of, uh, of um, the uh, access to energy for us, and also the promises that have been made over time. You know, 100 billion US dollars was the promises in previous COP, uh, in, in several of the other, uh, in several of the other climate change conferences. And these have simply not showed up. We simply have not found the funding that is required for these transitions. And as I've said, you know, uh, uh, just for energy access issues alone, our, our needs are certainly greater than many of the uh, developed countries and, you know, those needs should be addressed. I hope is never lost. We strongly believe that uh, the, the, these obligations will be met. In any event, they, they, they have to be met if uh, the, the transition goals, if the transition goals are to be met. So I think that um, we, we remain very hopeful and we must continue to put our case uh, uh, clearly because really, I mean, everyone knows that in order to be able to effectively transit in the way that um, we've all agreed and even to comply with the various international agreements, this is the, I mean, this, this, is, this is fundamental. So I, I don't think that um, not putting our case clearly, merely because there have been, uh, there, there have been defaults in the past, uh, is the way to go. I strongly believe that we should uh, say exactly what it is that is required and hope uh, that our partners would um, uh, do uh, the honorable thing. 
I think some of the arguments, you know, uh, merely require uh, being restated clearly because uh, they are pretty intuitive. And, and I think that um, because everyone is committed to uh, zero emissions in, in, in the ways that have been agreed, I, I would say that any reasonable argument that makes this uh, more, more likely to happen within the time frames that have been prescribed will be accepted by all. You know, so, so for example, the argument that we need um, uh, fossil fuels, especially gas, to transit to, uh, to, uh, to renewable energies eventually and to transit to zero emission, emissions, it's, 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 a, it's a very clear and logical one. And one of the major reasons is that you need gas, for example, to ensure that we are able to contain deforestation. Firewood is, of course, used broadly in several, you know, uh, African countries, especially in the rural areas. LPG is the answer to that, you know, and of course, it's cleaner. It's much, much cleaner. So if we want to avoid deforestation, that's obviously the way to go. And, and so I, I think that some of these arguments are compelling. And, and, I, and I have, you know, I, I'm strongly of the view that when, when we present these arguments as, as clearly and show what the, uh, the actual benefits are to the overall objective of, of net zero emissions, uh, we, we should be able to persuade uh, our partners. I, I'm not, uh, and I think that already uh, we are getting uh, some traction on, on some of the issues that we're, that we're raising. And I believe that we, 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 will, we will achieve the clear objective of being able to make the case that um, a just and fair transition can only mean that will we'll enable the use of uh, clean uh, fossil fuels, such as gas, uh, at least during that transition period and for as long as is necessary. You know, all of these are related, which obviously is why the, uh, the topic is, uh, or the theme of this conference is as it was laid out. Every one of these issues is related. Climate change, of course, is related to uh, the questions around uh, energy use and all that. And that's why we are making the arguments that we're making, that we must be able to control deforestation, for example. Uh, and one of the ways of the controlling deforestation is just as I've mentioned, we need to be able to use more gas. We need to, we need to, en we need to ensure that more people have access to energy. How do we ensure that more people have access to energy? I mean, before we get to the use, before we are able to use uh, renewable energy in, 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 much greater, uh, in, in much greater form than we're using it at the moment, we certainly need uh, to be able to deal with the questions around uh, use of, of, of gas. But also, uh, if, if you look at some of the work that's going on and some of the collaboration that's going on across uh, West Africa, for instance, on the uh, Great Green Wall projects, where, where, where there's a, a tree planting efforts are going on, to be able to arrest to some extent the deforestation. And then some of the big plans around the uh, livestock transformation plans, which would encourage uh, more sedentary, uh, which would encourage more sedentary livestock farming, and all of those those ideas. Now these are huge problems that have bedeviled uh, many of the uh, many of our countries, especially you know the Sahel region, for years and years and years. But the, and the problems cannot be solved overnight. But I think that some of what we're trying to do, some of these various components, once they come together, we'll be able to see uh, a, a, a sea change. We'll be able to see a substantial, a substantial change in, in the circumstances. Uh, one of the things that you've mentioned and, and clearly is a major problem for the continent is the lack of money despite the pledges that have been made by industrialized nations but it's not just a case of the climate finance is it it's also the political will are you convinced that your counterparts in the west in industrialized nations do have the political will i ask that because when we're looking at covid and there are direct parallels that many are drawing we see this inequality growing i mean the fact that you have so many thousands of grassroots organizations saying, well, maybe we should actually stop co uh, the, the COP26 because we can't get there, speaks of that major inequality. Mm. So 
what about in terms of the environment, in terms of climate change? Are they actually, are you convinced they are listening because they have the political will to listen and to create this fairer, just society? Hmm. I, I, I think the truth is that every country, and most countries of the world anyway, would look to their interests first. But I think it's also becoming obvious that uh, that simply isn't the way the world works. And it's, it, it, it isn't, it, it certainly uh, isn't even feasible, you know. So uh, whether as a matter of self-interest or for more altruistic reasons, uh, you begin to look at how others, you know, especially those uh, in the less developed world will, will survive, how they will do well and taking them into account in the big plans and all of that. Whether it's for self-interest or for altruistic reasons, there's no question in my mind that that must be the way to go. And that the, and that the, the, the arguments are compelling for our partners uh, in the wealthier countries uh, to see that there's absolutely no way out. I mean, just to, to the point that you made, about COVID-19 and, you know, vaccine nationalism and all of that. I think it's becoming obvious to the world that you cannot have uh, uh, vaccine nationalism and expect the world to be a safe place. I mean, no one is safe if uh, half of the world still runs the risk of uh, high infection rates of COVID or any other disease. No one is safe. I th and I think that these are arguments that... Um, uh, compel uh, everyone. And we've seen even from uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccines and some of the more, uh, uh, some of the more, uh, if you like, some more co collaboration that's taking place today. I think there's a, a lot more collaboration. There's a lot more emphasis on trying to work together, get more vaccines across to developing countries who may not be able to afford it. I think there's, there's a, a greater move in that respect. And I can see that that will be the case as we go along. And this is the same with climate change. You know, you may start off and some of our partners start off thinking of themselves and thinking of their countries and their regions. But it is up to us, and this is a point that we've been making uh, for the past couple of months and years, that is up to us to make the case, a compelling case, which I believe we're making, that you simply cannot expect any real great results if you leave uh, such a significant part of the world out of your considerations. So, so we're, I, I am hopeful. I'm very optimistic that um, our partners in, in the wealthier countries will uh, see the point.